privacy is the fundamental enabler of so many things. And I think if you give that up, you give up free speech, you give up freedom of thought. And, and if you give those things up, you really lose like the fundamental mechanism in society that allows us to progress as humans. We can't talk about stuff. Then how do we flesh out ideas? I think there are arguments on both sides that hopefully resonate for people. On, on one side of it, it's, well, if, if, if a certain behavior is legal, buying a rifle to go hunting, do I really want my bank to know that? Do I really want the government to know that? On the other end of it, you might say, hey, do I really want my credit card company or the government to know that I'm receiving certain medical procedures? Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sparkfly Podcast. I'm Sheila Transaction, sponsored by Zcash. Really, really excited to have Amitabh down here and so many other in our audience and, and our, our, in our audience to actually help uh, ask really wonderful questions. So thank you so, so much for joining Amitabh. It's a really, really big pleasure to have you on. I remember I met you on a plane once a while ago. <laughs> that was the first time I met you. And since then, I've been tracking and following your work really closely. I know that you invested also in companies of like friends of mine including like Josh Mobile Coin and so forth. And yeah. so I think that you have this ethos of privacy that really follows you and that, that, that really drives your investments at Electric. And so I'm really excited to talk to you today. And yeah, I mean, I have lots of different questions, but maybe we just started at the first one. If you could introduce yourself maybe in a few words and also talk to me a little bit about why is it that you got interested in the space that you bring you in? Like, because mm. the privacy mandate is so strong and it's so particular. So what yeah. got you into that? Yeah, so uh, great to be here. Thank you for having me. So my background, maybe maybe I'll give you a quick 30 seconds on my background and then, yeah, it's a good question of how we got into the privacy stuff. So my background is mostly as an entrepreneur. I started and sold two companies and then the second one to Facebook and was there for a few years and then left and I'd become a pretty active angel investor like in mid, like 2015-ish. And I was really fortunate to be involved with a number of really great companies over the years that have gone on to do well. So things sort of outside of crypto, things like Notion and Airtable and Figma, sort of like traditional companies, a lot of frontier tech, so things like self-driving cars and supersonic airplanes, and then crypto. And the way we got into crypto was we, the company that we were doing back in 2010 was essentially a way to take a lot of distributed computational workloads, distribute them across a bunch of different data centers. And essentially we were like running a giant distributed video encoding service. And, and that was kind of a, a bunch of the IP that Facebook bought. It, it, it could do a lot more and we did a lot of interesting things with it. But in that process, we came across a, big, a bunch of Bitcoin miners in like 2010. And we said, oh, what is this thing? My co-founder had a distributed systems background. He'd worked on things like protein folding at home, if, if anybody remembers those projects from like 15 years ago in grad school. And we, we said, oh, this is really interesting. This is potentially a way to pay for computational power on a distributed network. Like any, anybody who's tried to go put machines in server racks in different data centers is, oh my God, I wish I didn't have to do this. Can somebody just do this for me? And then I can write code and ship it. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about the infrastructure. And so we actually fundamentally misunderstood Bitcoin. That's not what Bitcoin is. If you try to write Bitcoin script, it's terrible. And we're like, we used it for a while. And we're like, wow, this is actually terrible. <laughs> this is not good for doing distributed computational workloads at all. And so we sort of abandoned the idea. And then we saw Ethereum in like 2015. We said, oh, this is the thing that we thought Bitcoin was. Five years ago, this thing might work. And so we sort of got enamored with that. And we started playing with that. And then that sort of snowballed into going down the, down the crypto rabbit hole, which forced us to understand monetary policy and fiscal policy and hard money and all this other stuff. And then we understood Bitcoin. So we, it's funny, we, like a lot of people, I think that enter crypto go sort of like the finance, gold, Bitcoin, oh, Ethereum is programmable, but Bitcoin, they sort of go that direction. We basically went the exact opposite direction in terms of our understanding of how to, how to get into the space. And so we've been playing with, with that stuff since 2015, 2016. We were early investors in a number of companies that have gone and do well in the space. And we formalized a lot of that activity into 2018. And, and kind of one of the things that was a catalyst for that was our, our thought process was, well, if this is really as a, as a wedge, as a starting point, we think one of the first killer applications here is software eating money. And so we said, okay, well, if this is software eating money, it's going to eat all the capital markets of the world. And venture capital is just one form of capital deployment. And if you look at the history of software eating markets and industries, generally the companies that end up winning in those markets as they get eaten by software tend to be software first. They tend to be run by software engineers. So take an example, it would be Amazon versus Walmart. And you say, well, why is that? Walmart had amazing distribution centers. They had satellites. They had what was going on. Why couldn't Walmart win? Why can't they, why can't they just get a website up? And it's because it's not so easy. It's not so easy to just get a website up and running. What you have to do is you really have to go back and retool your whole human organization. You have to upend the whole human organization. What you have to do is give power to the software engineers and take power away from everybody else. 
And so what the CEO of Walmart would have to do is go in there and say, you know what? I'm no longer the CEO. I'm now the COO. That person over there that we call the chief information officer, which is already sort of a, from like a software company's perspective, you're like, that's bizarre. Why don't you have a CPO and a CTO and like overstaff on that side? Okay, but now that person is the new CEO. And by the way, everybody in that organization makes twice the money and everybody in my organization, you now make half the money. And they're just, they're not gonna be able to do that, right? Humans can't do that. And so what happens is you get a new organization that starts, you get somebody like Bezos that comes in and says, we're gonna give all the power to the engineers. They're gonna make twice the money. The partnerships people, who cares who has a relationship with Safeway or Procter & Gamble? Those guys make half the money now. And so the human organization sort of has to change with the infrastructure. So our, our belief was actually, if, if you want to do venture right, if you want to sort of create value from the ground up and help founders do stuff, you just gonna have to fundamentally do it differently here and, and to be able to operate on chain and you have to build your organization differently. So we're built differently at, at the firm at Electric. We're about 25 people. We are 13 engineers. Um, we have a technical fellow. He used to be VP of engineering at Robinhood. We have people who've worked on systems at Bloomberg and in TradFi. Curtis, Ken, Maria, and I, the, the partners on the firm, all have computer science backgrounds and have started companies and worked at tech companies. And so we do a lot of stuff very differently internally. If you look at the org chart, it looks more like a startup than it does a VC firm, but that's that's very much by design. So we don't hire associates. We don't hire principals. We just hire engineers. And then we sort of slot them in to do stuff. But it's a big experiment. It's, it's TBD if that actually produces a better firm or better returns, but at least it's different. And so that's in parallel sort of the, the experiment that we're running on our side. And then to, to the second half of your question, I'm happy to talk about any of that and why why we do things the way well, that we do. Just, I guess, yeah, just, uh, I know that you write this like developer report, which yeah. is really interesting because you don't really focus so much on PMs or even like on mods or something in the crypto <laughs> space, but yeah. you're trying to evaluate the health of the crypto space mostly yeah. really by looking at developers and by how much they have grown. And I wonder if you have any insights or something. There's a great tweet thread as well that you link to from your Twitter that yeah. really goes into the depth of this. But yeah, I'm just super curious, like what prompted you to write this report of this kind of ecosystem health report and then the focus on Dash is, is also really interesting. Yeah, it's a great question. We So back in 2018, there was just a dearth of data and uh, sort of fundamentals data. And uh, we, we saw all this sort of price data. We saw some on-chain data that you could look at, but a lot of it felt like lagging data to us. And so we said, okay, well, what is the leading data? What is the leading indicator of value creation? And to us, it's basically where, like a very simple heuristic, if you, if you think about it, like investing, is, it can be very complicated, but if you if you go listen to any of the great investors of all time, whether it's Mike Moritz or, or Warren Buffett or any, any of these people, right? A lot of times they actually distill it down to some really simple principles. And I think in venture, like, one of the really simple principles is if you just invest in what the developers are doing and you just invest in what the college kids are doing, you'll probably make a lot of money. It's actually not that hard, right? Now, there's a lot of nuance there, but it's been a pretty good rule. I think Dixon, Chris Dixon has a, has a saying, something like, I'm going to butcher it, but it's something like whatever, the so whatever your software engineer friends are doing on the weekends for hobbies, what you'll do for a job in 10 years, right? So there's like a lot of sort of people have triangulated on this general idea. And so we looked at that and we said, okay, if that's a leading indicator, how do we even know what qualitatively we see stuff, but how do we quantify that? Like, how do we, how do we think about where that's actually happening? And so we built this system and by we, I really mean Curtis, he's, he's a phenomenal engineer and my partner, he, uh, he wrote this crawling engine that can crawl basically a bunch of open source, GitHub, GitLab, like any, anywhere where we can find code on the internet, we can crawl it and then extract a bunch of metadata out of it. And so we can, we can look at timestamps, we can look at frequency of code commits, we can look at who did it because on GitLab, you know, GitLab or GitHub, it might be tied to an identity. And then we, we sort of archive all of that. So I think in the last report, we looked at something like 500 million or so code commits, and then we can analyze all that. And so to us, that's just the leading indicators. Like if, if there are, you look at Ethereum, it has, I have to go back and look at the numbers. I, I can pull it up actually, but you're talking about thousands of monthly active developers. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's quite phenomenal. And so you look at something like Ethereum, I'm pulling up the numbers right now. Yeah. So there's 5,700 as, as of the end of last year, as of December, 2022, there's 5,700 monthly active developers in Ethereum writing code, open source only. So this doesn't count people working at custodians or exchanges or in companies. And so when we started looking at some of those numbers, we said, wow, if you have, at the time it was just hundreds, but you're like, man, if you have hundreds of people writing code every month, like eventually that's going to result in some value creation. And so that sort of was the insight that kicked it off. And since then it sort of has become bigger and bigger and bigger, and we can do all sorts of interesting analyses. We actually just, it's always really interesting too, when you sort of take this sort of an approach at where it can take you. We, we actually just did a, a, a an analysis, which we're going to publish today that actually Coinbase was just talking about, just blogged about it yesterday around the geographic distribution of these developers. And so we, because we have sort of self-reported data, like people will self-report on Twitter or on GitHub and they'll tell you where in the world they are. 
And then they also self-report on a hub. And then there's also timestamps and, and often self-reported time zones when people are doing code commits that we can look at. And so we can look at that and, and look at where there's been growth. And what you see actually is that the United States is today about 29% market share of developers and has been losing 2% market share per year for the last five years. So it was about 40%. And so while the ecosystem has grown 10x, the U.S. has actually lost 10% market share, which is which from like a U.S. policymaker perspective should be very concerning because the markets that are picking up share um, are India, Southeast Asia, which we actually look at perhaps as a proxy for, for China because there's a lot of VPN activity and then Eastern Europe. So actually, it's really interesting. If you look at Ukraine, you see Ukraine is something like two to 3% market share for a few years, 16, 17, 18, 19. And then the war happens. And it, it basically goes up like 50 to 100%. Because I think as, as anybody who has friends here probably knows, I, I personally had friends who were there. Like I, I had a friend who was also in our portfolio. He had a, his wife and his newborn daughter were in the country. And, and when bombs start going off and the internet goes out and power goes out, the banking system stops. And so he was able to get his wife and daughter across the border through the country and across the border because he, he paid somebody. He could pay somebody in crypto. So he paid them. He, he could demonstrate that he had the money and he paid them to get, get his wife and daughter across the border into Poland. I think Ukrainians really understand the power of this stuff right now. And it's really interesting. You just see that in the data. There's just this spike after the war of an additional couple of percent. So anyway, from a U.S. policymaker perspective, you start to look at this and you say, wow, that, that's actually potentially concerning because if all of the activity is happening outside of U.S. jurisdictions, what does that mean for what kind of influence you have? You see this happening with TikTok right now, for example, what can the U.S. really do? And you know, what, how it's, setting aside sort of the specifics of the situation and, and whether you're pro-American or not, or there's, there's a lot of nuance to this, but just sort of purely from a game theory perspective, that's bad, right? If, if you're a government, you, you sort of, that's, that's not the situation you want to be in. And imagine how much worse it would be if Amazon and Google and Facebook and all of the top internet companies were not based in the U.S. Like the U.S. would have zero leverage. And, and as, as citizens of the United States, we would have zero leverage and, and because these are technology platforms. And I think Maybe this is a dovetail into some of the stuff we can talk about around privacy, but the ability, like these, these systems are not valueless, right? There are assumptions that get baked into the technology. And I think if our small democratic notions of free speech and privacy and due process and these things aren't baked into the technology, I think we could end up in a pretty dystopian world. It, even aside from the sort of pragmatic constraints around the U.S. has SWIFT, and, and that's the thing that probably the U.S. government wants to retain, there's sort of this like philosophical thing of do we do we really want to seed the philosophical high ground here? How, what are the value systems that get baked into these technologies? And, and do we want other parts of the world or other regions or other governments to really dictate those? Hey, mother. You want to jump in? You just had a quick question. So I, I don't know if you take the EIP repos into the electric capital developer report, but I've seen like hundreds of developers make like small comments and, and reviews to the yeah. new, because EIPs are super complicated. They need, Last of six to eight months of discussion, then two months yeah. of proof of concept. Like there are yeah. like hundreds of developers who don't make actual comments, but yeah. give reviews, ad links and stuff like that. Are they included in the report? So anything that's a PR will get included. Comment like GitHub comments won't. So the discussion around it, we don't we don't capture in that particular report. We actually have some other internal tools that that we use that we haven't published. But it's just because it's the signal is a lot noisier and it, it take, it's harder to interpret, which we call our community report. And there we can look at a lot of these kinds of signals, like what are, what are people talking about in Telegram or Discord or on Twitter or on Reddit, or there, there are all these sort of social channels. And then you can do a bunch of analysis around there. And our thought is, I mean, no, no measure of this kind of stuff is perfect. Obviously there's, there's a lot of bias. And, and so you just sort of have to understand what you're looking at. And so I think, I think all of the data in our report is an undercounting of what's happening very much by design rather than overstatements. We're not counting the closed source devs. We have a we have a segmentation in there that we call full time developers, which is you have to have ten or more code commits per month, which is a high bar actually. When we publish it, we we often get devs that will tweet back at us being like, "Wait a second, I don't do ten. I'm full time. I literally this is the only thing I do, and I don't do ten code commits a month. I do six. Right? I'm writing code most of the most of the week. I don't have time to do the commits. So it's it's purposely a high bar on all this stuff, and so we don't include include essentially the discussion happening around it. But I think there are other ways to measure that and get at that. The other thing worth noting is with uh, with any of the developer metrics that we have, you know, quantity is not a substitute for quality. And so there is this notion too of, okay, well, 50 developers working on zero knowledge proofs is is qualitatively different than a thousand engineers writing documentation, right? Or the notion of 10x engineers, right? So 
So it's an imperfect measure. And so we're always sort of trying to tweak it and understand it. Or the ecosystems evolve too. And so one of the really interesting things that's happening now, which I'm, I'm sure people here have some experience with too, is it looks like the EVM has some degree of network effects. And so how do you think about where to attribute developer activity, right? So if, if something like if, if Polygon or Avalanche or Near has Aurora, like if these folks have are making EVM contributions to make their systems better, but it's contributing back to ETH, or if a developer writes some code that is EVM, you know, that is targeting the EVM and it can run on ETH and an L2 and could work on Aurora on Near, like how do, where do you attribute those developers? So it's actually getting more complicated as the system, as these systems are sort of evolving and the, the ecosystems are getting more complex, I think. So we'll keep evolving the report. So if you have, if you have thoughts on, on how we can make it better or, or if there are questions, you know, hey, I, I'd be really curious to, to, to understand how to think about this, please send them over to us. We're always sort of iterating. Every year we iterate on like how to think about this stuff. Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I think especially during the bear market, I think it's really cool to see like what actual work is being done yeah. like, behind the scenes. And it's it's really cool. I mean, that's what like we will be tracking in terms of yeah. value. Like, well, you know, one of the work, really, so like, yeah, one of the really interesting things on the bear market too is, which is, which is why I love the developer signal is developers tend to be much stickier than price. With the intuition here being it's relatively easy to unroll a trade. You're like, oh, I bought a bunch of whatever token. Even if I believe in it, it's down 60%. I'm out. So I'll sell because I think it's going to go down 90% and maybe I'll buy back in. That's how, you know, it's easy to unwind a trade. It's really hard to unwind a career decision, right? If you spent six or 12 months getting up to speed on this space, maybe 18 months because you saw the last cycle, you found a great group of people that you really want to work with, you come in and then the market starts to crash. Well, A, you may not know it's a bear market for six months or 12 months even. You certainly don't want to leave, right? From a resume perspective, it's going to look terrible. You're going to look like an opportunist. So you're going to, it's going to look like you went in and most people don't want to just unwind that in three or six months. There's this human connection thing. You're like, well, I have this great team. We're making a bunch of progress. It's a lot of fun working at the startups. So I don't want to leave. And so what you tend to see is people are around for 18 months because they don't want to unwind their career decision. But then the market starts to come back 18 months later and they're like, oh, actually, maybe it's coming back. Maybe it's not dead. And then they all kind of stick around. And so you literally, you see that in the data. So number of developers will go up exponentially and then it sort of like oscillates and starts to go down. So it might go down 10 or 20%. So it goes down 10% when prices go down 80%. And then the next run starts to happen and then like a whole 5x more developers come in. It's really, you can literally see it in the data. It's really interesting that, to see it play out that way, which is also yeah. why we think it's, it's like the right signal to be looking at. I, I agree. Maybe just to really dive into privacy first, that is kind of like a pretty, yeah. a pretty direct really focus of the entire fund that you're leading. And I'm yeah. really curious why that is. Like, what, what what do you think people are missing about why this is so important and why are you totally leaning into that? Yeah, so I think we're, we're probably, I think it's fair to say we're probably one of the larger seed investors in, in privacy-focused tech. So we did we did Espresso, we've done Ironfish, MobileCoin, Oasis. We were we held a bunch of Zcash back in the day. And so it's something we, we sort of have cared about for a long time. I think there are, there are two, like I've thought about this and sort of unpacking it, I think there are, there are actually two motivations. One is just for, for so many people, I think there's the like rational overlay to something emotional that you've experienced. And, and those are often tied together. I think the the rational thing is just we, we've come to believe that just privacy is a it's a human right. It's a, it's a fundamental human right. But it's it's purely just from a utilitarian perspective, I think it's it's the fundamental enabler of so many things. And I think if you give that up, you give up free speech, you give up freedom of thought. And, and if you give those things up, you really lose like the fundamental mechanism in society that allows us to progress as humans. We can't talk about stuff then how do we flesh out ideas? I want to say it's a Moxie blog post from seven or eight or nine or 10 years ago, but it's something, the insight is basically like everything good today was at some point illegal, right? It was like as a society had sort of deemed those things not worth doing. And you can roll that back 500 years or a thousand years and, and it's obvious, right? And so you have to have ways for people to have those conversations and, and be able to kick those ideas around and say, well, hey, this thing that today is unpalatable Maybe it's not so bad and maybe we should have a conversation about whether or not that's so bad. But if you don't have a way to do that, then you can't actually make progress. And so to us, it's sort of a fundamental driver of human progress. And so if you think humans can be getting better and we should be getting better and there's so many areas where we should be getting better, and then without the ability to discuss those things, then then you can't make progress and, and you fundamentally need privacy to be able to discuss those things. That manifests in all sorts of ways. I think the conversation is one form of it, but where and how you spend your money is is just another form of that. And it, these things can get political. And, and so I think there are arguments on both sides that hopefully resonate for people. On, on one side of it, it's, well, if, if if a certain behavior is legal, buying buying a shotgun to go hunting or buying a rifle to go hunting, 
do I really want my bank to know that and then decide to shut me off at some point? Do I really want the government to know that? Maybe, maybe not, right? Like certain people may say, actually, yeah, I don't want the government to necessarily know that. Now there are other ways to get the security and safety and you should be doing background checks and there, there's sort of other ways to account for the, for the risks there. On the other end of it, you might say, hey, do I really want my credit card company or the government to know that I'm receiving certain medical procedures, right? And, and we've seen in, in the last 24 months in the United States how, how rules around abortion have been, have been rolled back and what the consequences are at the state level and for individuals. And um, you know, why is that anybody's business? It's, it's a personal medical procedure. So I think like on, on both sides of it, you can sort of very quickly get at actually, yes, there, there is a like fundamental reason for something that you fundamentally care about that, that privacy enables those things. And then there's also just like the economic businesses can't do business without privacy. Like you can't pay your employees without private payroll. You can't do business with another business without privacy. It's just like the economy doesn't work without privacy. So there's just sort of the, the sort of all those are like to me, all of the sort of rational reasons, whether it's like human society doesn't progress without privacy to you as an individual have certain things that you care about that that you can't get without privacy or to like literally the economy can't work without privacy. And those are all sort of the rational reasons, I think. And then the philosophical reason or the personal reason is just like I grew up, I was born in India and I, I moved to the US when I was a kid and I mostly grew up in the South. Uh, and I, I mostly grew up in places where there weren't really a lot of people that looked like me. And it was actually phenomenal in so many ways. It, it gave me like a, a, a truly amazing set of skills, but, but it also gave me a very healthy skepticism for authority because the, the, the authorities in, in a lot of those systems, even, even whether it's police or your local government or the school, were not exactly friendly <laughs> sometimes. And so it actually created this like very deep rooted skepticism of authority, not necessarily like anger or, or anything negative in that way. It's just sort of like the realization that, that institutions don't necessarily have to be on your side. And, and that understanding, I think, is like pretty deeply rooted. And, and I think privacy is sort of is a, is a defense against that. So I think having thought about it a lot for myself personally, I think it's sort of just rooted in my personal experience as well as like the ability to have privacy because the institutions that, that we rely on to sort of mediate a lot of society may not necessarily be on your side all the time. And, and so you, you, as an individual, you do need this sort of extra layer of protection. And so, yeah, we try to manifest that. One, one, one sort of litmus test that we use on the privacy stuff. And in general, I think with investing, we have, we have the good fortune of being able to invest in a sector that is growing very quickly, sort of the crypto backdrop, technology and software sort of in this era. I think we'll look back in 100 years and we'll keep making all sorts of progress. Um, but you know, something like 1990 to 2030, let's say, sort of this 50 year window, it might be like plastics in the 50s or something. There's just sort of this 40 year window where you're like, wow, I can't believe we went up the S curve from zero people to 3 billion people all having supercomputers in their pockets and super AI in their pocket and digital money they can like this 40 or 50 year window is so phenomenal that we get to ride this S curve. And, and I'm truly grateful for that. So we have this luxury of knowing directionally that we get to ride essentially the market beta. And so we have this luxury of being able to put our capital towards things that we're really proud to put the money into. So one of the things we always talk about and has generally worked in our favor, and, and I can talk about this in more detail if anybody's interested, but is, is, is a phrase stolen from, from a good friend of mine, Blake Scholl. He's the founder of Boom Supersonic. They're building supersonic airplanes. And uh, he doesn't have a background in, in aerospace or aeroscience. He's a computer scientist. And, uh, and he's an old friend of mine. And, and when he was getting the company off the ground, we spent a lot of time talking about why he was doing this thing where he had basically zero expertise at the time. Now he's like a world expert in supersonic airplanes and supersonic flight and, and all this stuff, right? He literally sat down and read, taught, taught himself physics and fluid dynamics and all these things. But he said something that really stuck with me, which we've tried to carry into our, our investing in electric is you, you want to set the bar for what you do at even if you failed, you're proud that you tried. And I think that's really important because I think too often people do the thing because they want the outcome. And, and actually, I think if you set the bar at, we're going to do this. And even if we try and fail, we're proud that we did it. So the outcome doesn't matter. The reason we're doing it is because we believe in the thing. That really changes your perspective on where you spend your time and, and ultimately as an investor, where we spend our capital. And the privacy stuff to me is just the LPs are, are wouldn't love to hear this, but I think they understand that actually this is the right way to make a lot of money in the long term if you're long term greedy, is that all of this privacy driven stuff that we're investing in, even if it all failed, we're proud that we tried because it, it's fundamentally important for the world for this stuff to exist. Yeah, I mean, I think like one thing I agree is that 
I mean, A, I think it, it reminds me a little bit of the saying of if you want to hit the moon, shoot for Mars. Yeah. But, you know, even if you don't land anywhere, like it's still nice to have tried to shoot for Mars yeah. in the first place also. <laughs> um, yeah. And then the second thing is, I think one thing about privacy is just like the moment that you realize that you had wanted it too late to implement it. Yeah. Like it's this kind of thing that you have to yeah. do before, before like should hit the fan. And yeah. like humans aren't really good at the preventative stuff. Like in general, like we just started getting around to doing some kind of like window dressing solution once we've already failed and yeah, you could just yeah. need to do that for privacy. And that yeah. leads me to my next question for that, which is arguably for much of the crypto space right now, it is already too late, right? Yeah. So my so many transactions are already like on public chains and we've interacted and like really made us like massively vulnerable. <laughs> I think like most people really, especially there were already crypto holders, like yeah. are already like quite exposed. Uh, yeah. And the kind of game theory, especially the offense defense balance may not be in our favor as AI tools like to track down individual folks are just getting better over time. So I'm really curious to see your perspective on like, how can we rebuild some of that space and privacy preserving way? Are there specific technologies that you're really interested in? Mm -hmm. Is it kind of still possible to get some of that back? Or do you think we just have to like now start kind of do a bit of a tabula, tabula rasa or at least from now on do better? Like what's your opinion on, on, on how the general space is doing with it? Yeah, I'm actually pretty optimistic. I think the, the internet's a little bit of a guide here, right? We were able to get HTTPS layered on top and it, it didn't solve all the problems. You're still bleeding your IP address, right? And so that's sitting in Google's database and you can actually infer a lot from an IP address over time. And so it's not it's not perfect by any means, but, but actually getting like end-to-end -end encryption on mobile devices and being able to have those kinds of tools exist, I think got us maybe 60, 70% of the way there, like two thirds of the way there. And so I suspect a similar thing will happen here in crypto. And, uh, and so I think we'll start layering privacy on top in interesting ways. And, and a lot of the ZK stuff might work there. So you might have L2s with Z ZK baked in and, and that sort of settles down to an ETH L1, which is more transparent. And I'm not, I, I don't know, short answer, but I suspect that's how it will play out. And I think in part it will play out that way, not because of, of philosophical reasons, but for pragmatic reasons, which is I think businesses and institutions don't want to have all their wallets leaked all the time. And so they'll be the ones pushing for it. And so it's just, I think it's just pragmatism on the dollar side that, yeah, it's, it's sort of like an, another way to say, it, I think what you're getting at, Allison, is sort of like, mo you, you might assert that most people in the world don't care about privacy or don't fully understand privacy and, and therefore don't, don't value it in the short term as much as they should, because it is like one of these long-term existential issues, as you noted. But I think if you weight it from a dollar weighted perspective, I would argue that most dollars in the world do care about privacy. And so, and it's a relatively small number of institutions and people are on a dollar rated basis control most of the capital of the world. And so actually, because these systems, so much of them are fundamentally about moving money around, I think you actually might get privacy solutions happening. So there's, there's two tactics. I think you could try to take, Hey, like, look, you just really need base layer privacy, build it from the ground up and, and go. And, and so I think that's things like mobile coin or Ironfish or people, Zcash, people, people have sort of taken that approach. And then I think the other approach is let's layer it on. And I think people are taking that approach and, or Amina or now Espresso or some of the ZK EVM stuff, what you're done, what you're doing is building a bunch of ZK expertise in that team. And they're initially using it for essentially scalability, but, but eventually because those primitives are baked in, you could reuse those things in, in other ways. So I don't know which of those two approaches will win. Our approach, we have the grand luxury of building a portfolio. So we get to do both. So we just invest in both and we're like, look, all of this will, is good. And, and at least half of it will, will work. And so that'll be great. And then the other half can pivot into the other approach. And so if you built a really great L1 and you have all that ZK expertise, maybe you can pivot into something. So yeah, I don't know how it'll play out. I, I'm optimistic though, that we'll be able to layer it on, on top. Now I think, how might that be, how might we be wrong about that? Like what, what, why, why it may it not work out that way? I think the big thing here, which I think we're starting to see play out with some of the stuff that's happened recently with the SEC is that I think we the, the the political climate and the societal climate today is very different than it was in the 90s with the internet it is a lot of the same problems like we, i spent some time with if anybody knows cindy Cohn over at eff she's phenomenal I'm, I'm a big cindy fanboy and if anybody doesn't know her you should go read her wikipedia profile and do some research on her like the the internet doesn't exist without cindy so it's a lot of the same problems from the 90s and but the climate has changed namely i think because of 9-11 and because of what technology has become. So on the political side, it's a, it's a sort of an interesting thought experiment. When we were having these sort of questions around strong encryption in the 90s, and the case that, that the technologists were able to make is that, look, this is, it enables e-commerce and credit cards and all this stuff. How would that have conversation have gone if it were actually September 2002 instead of like 1995 that, that those conversations were happening? 
And I suspect it would have gone very differently, actually. So I think the like the political climate post 9-11 in the United States really changed in sort of like a post-terrorism sort of world, post-Cold World, new new terrorism. And I think that's a real thing. And, and and you sort of, I think, see that in a lot of places. The the second is that I think tech won. In the 90s, the, the software people were the pirates, they were the outsiders, it was the cypherpunks, it was it was Wall Street was was the people that had all the money and the power in the world. And that's no longer the case, actually. If you look at, just go look at the Fortune 100 and you're like, well, who are all the biggest companies in the world and who has all the money and the power and who has all the reach? And it's a bunch of software companies, right? It's, it's Apple and Google and Microsoft and Facebook. And you start looking at that and you're like, wow, it's actually like the outsiders won. <laughs> so now the outsiders are the insiders. And I think from a society perspective, that's really changed the dynamic where, where I think rightly, a lot of people are skeptical. They're like, look, what have you done for me lately? What, what value have you really created for me? Like how much, how much have you extracted from me relative to how much you've given? Who's really benefited from this? I mean, if you, if you look at the software revolution, everybody in the world, I think, has benefited tremendously from PCs and, and Android phones in their pocket and so on. And, and I think that is a, is a big driver on, on moving people out of poverty and the access to information and all those things. At the same time, the raw dollars that get extracted from that, a couple trillion dollars worth of economic dollars, right, between the, the appreciation and stock prices and equity and, and cash and all the, the hard capital that flows through that, basically concentrated on like the two coasts of the United States, That's right? All the companies on the on the West Coast of the United States and, and the, the financial center of the United States for the last 20 years. And so rightly, a lot of people are like, wait a second, like all the millionaires and billionaires are these tech people. And like U.S. median income is still fifty thousand, fifty-five thousand dollars a year, which it's been for like twenty years, right? And so I think there's a very healthy skepticism of 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 tech in a way and technology that that people are going to look at these things and say, wait, are you just is this just sort of like the same the same thing all over again? I'm trying to remember. There's some phrase I thought was really elegant. It's it's I haven't had coffee today, so my brain's a little slow. But you know, it's it's something like you have to be skeptic. You have to be skeptical of the people who promise revolution because the revolutionaries are just the old people claiming to be revolutionaries. So it's like the same story over and over again. The revolutionaries show up and they're like, hey, the old system is broken. Trust me, I'm the revolutionary. And then the revolutionaries just become just as bad as the old system, right? And so always be skeptical of the revolutionaries. And so I think there's a little bit of society has learned that. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to start making the case that this time around, what is unique and different about these technologies is that you don't have to trust us. What we can do is bake the bake the rules of the system into the code, and you can audit that. And and if we all agree what those those rules are, we can ship the code in, in such a way that you don't have to trust me anymore. You don't have to trust the tech people. And and I think that's that's a pretty big mental shift that that I don't think we as an industry we we have not made that case to people. We have not helped them understand that the fundamental difference here is you don't have to trust us. There isn't there isn't going to be one CEO at the end of this that just decides what to do and can and. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, especially because I've been fortunate enough to benefit economically from from these over the last 20 years. It's like, how many companies in the early internet promised we're never going to put up ads, right? We're never going to take your data and, and target you against that. And and then they did, right? And this, and they made billions of dollars doing it. So um, I think it's just natural. It's, it's just the natural course of human events that that's how that plays out. But we have we have to make the case, I think, this time around that if we if we take those values and we encode them into the software on the front end. Then, then actually, it, it's quite hard to change them later. Like, how, how do you, like, people talk about, yeah, like, 21 million Bitcoin is a sort of is a social convention. In theory, we could go in and change the protocol, but think about how hard it would be to actually make that happen, right? And and but I think that's a very that's a very def, difficult thing to sort of convey to people. I think. Yeah, I mean, like to both of your points, to the first one of we're now in a different kind of political environment, also through nine eleven. But especially, I mean, I think there's a huge argument for arguably also why the U.S. government should care about U.S. privacy, right? Yeah. U.S. citizens are currently like exploitable yeah. and like really vulnerable yeah. uh, by other nation states too. And clearly, sure. like we know that zero day the zero day markets are like pretty strong, and and I think yeah. like and other nation states have much more of an advantage like really gain up and yeah and yeah. And, and, and and exploitability of, on a computer security level within for your citizens and the other argument that you made of well people don't really trust tech companies anymore well i mean those tech companies also didn't really do very many good things with their data in often cases and this is just yeah. a very different theme so like they should be more trust on, it's really on the side of the people the set of technology yeah. so i do wonder why that hasn't it somehow doesn't like compute for people or like why is it such a hard, hard argument yeah. to grasp i, I, I just don't yeah. get it well, well, two two thoughts on that. On on the the government side, I think it's also I spent a lot of time on on the government side behind the scenes, and it's interesting because the gov governments are also not monolithic. 
Um, and, and Mike, I, I see your hand. We'll, we, we'll, I'll get to you in just a sec, I guess. But, you know, it's interesting. Like when you zoom in on the government, there's sort of like SEC as a regulatory entity versus there are folks like Senator Gillibrand from New York or Congressman Patrick McHenry from North Carolina. And they really get crypto and they're like, yeah, we got to make this thing work. It's really, really important for the U.S. And they're on the, the policy maker side, the legislative side. And then there's people inside the White House who are super anti this stuff and they're people who get in. So even the government is not one monolithic entity. And so, yeah, it's really interesting. Like the, the national security agencies all get this and they're like actually pro crypto because, because they need privacy, like just to do their job. The CIA needs privacy to do its job. And so they get it or the NSA literally publishes uh, <laughs> the curves that we use. Right. So it's like, these, these are these, those entities get it on the second point. It's, um, I have two thoughts. One, I think there is this I mean, the, the mimetic way to put it maybe is like meet the meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And I think people have sort of learned that, right? The But I think part of it too is that I think actually every industry goes through this and I'm, I'm sure others who who, who have, have seen these and studied these cycles, I, I didn't live through it personally and that lived experience I do think is different. And so if others want to chime in on this from sort of 90s era, I think it, it might be relevant. But I think there's sort of this thing with with who enters technology and on the early part of the curve, what you really get are the revolutionaries and, and sort of like in political science context, it's sort of like exit versus voice. And what you get are the exit people, right? Satoshi was an exit person. He's like, look, the system is broken. I'm out. I'm going to create a new system. And that that's their superpower, like the ability to imagine a new system and create that new system. But once that new system becomes large enough, it has to interface with the old system in some way. And that's just sort of like the reality of how these things work. And so mediating that like via some sort of an API is really hard. And the types of people who tend to be good at constructing APIs and bridging worlds tend to not be exit people. They tend to be voice people, right? They have to be the people who understand how to talk. And that's like a natural transition I think every industry has to go through. And so what we need are actually voice people to help the public or help governments understand or help journalists understand like why all the things you just said, Allison. Now, the the challenge is, and I think in, in our modern world, is that you can go from zero to a billion people so much faster than you could 25 years ago that what what used to be an opportunity to get those people in the door, educate them. It's just a human problem. It's like any organization that goes from 10 people to a thousand people. We've seen this in startups over and over. It implodes. You just can't scale your culture that quickly enough. You can't train quickly. You can't train people quickly enough. They can't absorb that information that quickly. And so that's the challenge that we have is we've gone from being irrelevant to worth a trillion plus dollars in about 10 years, which is unprecedented, right? And, and now the AI folks are going through the same thing. Right. Literally, they're going to go from overnight at being a bunch of researchers who are thinking about these things to a billion people can use this stuff. And and I don't think as startups or as technologists, we're equipped for that. And, and so that it's almost a it's almost a curse to be able to scale that quickly. So like my my sort of contrarian hope actually is that crypto has an extended bear market because we need to stay irrelevant for a couple more years so that we can build really good user experiences, so that we can build really great documentation, so that we can build the muscle inside our organizations about how to talk about this stuff. Because if we get to 500 million people or a billion people on, on the next run, we might poison the well because we don't, we're not equipped yet with the tools to actually be able to have these conversations properly. And, and that's actually, I think, one of the bigger existential risks of the space is that we're just too successful too quickly. And then we, and then we just burn everybody. Sorry, yeah, one thing that uh, Mark always says to this is like the notion of a genetic takeover from biology, where a new system mm. is like grown within the old system yeah. and takes a lot of the features and is really informed by the old system until it then yeah. like, gradually like competes with it and eventually outcompetes it. But like it is still very much shaped by the old system too. So it's yeah. kind of like very slow genetic takeover. Correct. I just said that point. But yeah, Mike, can you go? And then I want to dive in on AI and crypto because yeah. Uh, no, AI and crypto. Awesome. Yeah. But Micah, if you have a question, go for it. Yes. So you mentioned earlier that you had the, the tech companies that everybody's scared of because you, they make a lot of promises and then they change their minds later yeah. and the exact opposite of what they said they were going to do, right? And then you have Bitcoin, which has, you don't have to trust anyone, right? Because it's immutable. Like the, the code is there, it runs, it will run forever. And I used to be in that, in that camp and believe that crypto, that, that was the number one selling point of crypto was that you could set up a system and then let it go run on its own and it would just run indefinitely. No one had the power change rules. One of the things that I'm concerned about is almost every other blockchain other than Bitcoin is highly mutable. Like they change mm -hmm. on a very regular basis. And yep. I, I mean, I was an active participant in the Ethereum core dev process for a few years. And the thing that finally drove me away from it is just that I was realizing that the governance process was very mutable itself and it was slowly being captured 
and you, you can mm. kind of see the ethos of those core developers from five years ago is very different from the ethos of the core developers mm. today. And and so you have the system like Ethereum that has all these these things and it's growing and it's got this giant network effect, but it, I don't feel like it really has any protection from turning into the same thing that the Googles and the Microsofts and the Facebooks all turned into eventually. Once, yeah. once they get captured, if you don't have protection against capture, you're eventually going to get captured. And once you do get captured, then all bets are off as to what happens. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on what can we do as a society or as a culture to try to better encourage people to follow the Bitcoin route or something and yeah. disallow or protect against capture specifically. Yeah, it's a it's a really excellent question and it's a really hard question and something we've thought about a bunch. And I think there's two or three threads to pull on there. So so one is to to what extent is this actually even avoidable? And I, I, I've actually come to the conclusion that in in most cases it's not it's sort of inevitable. It's just sort of like a property of human systems and and in so much as there are a bunch of humans evolved that are vying for power and control, like that that's just gonna happen. And so then then the question is like, how do you put in checks and balances to prevent that from happening too quickly and prevent the erosion from happening too quickly? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So so this is then where it takes you is how do you how do you have minimal human involvement as quickly as possible? And and I, I think there's sort of an interesting trade-off here of how do you build systems that are good and robust and comprehensive and scalable and all of these things while moving to them being as decentralized as possible to prevent that sort of capture? And and I don't think there's a right answer for that. I don't know a priori like what like which of those models is the right one for the long term. And so I think the only answer really is that we need to encourage as many people as possible to be in the experimentation pool. And so what we need is a thousand different variations of this to all sort of go out and and to try to compete and and try to win in that way. And 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 my hope is that we end up with with systems that are created by people who are properly philosophically motivated and and aligned and that they have a real shot of winning. I don't know if that will happen, right? I mean, it's entirely possible that the, that the market does not produce that sort of an outcome. I mean, we were talking about the EVM. It's a, it's a good example, I'm sure. Like Mark and Dean have thoughts on this. But it's like the EVM is broken in all sorts of ways and, and JavaScript is broken in all sorts of ways. And yet here we are, right? Just throw, throwing that out there for you, Mark. And uh, so like the best technology doesn't necessarily win in the market. And so, yeah, the best governance system may not win either. But but back to this idea of it's worth trying. I think the only, if we if we sort of acknowledge that that's a thing in the world, and then we say, okay, well, that's going to happen. These human systems are, are, are going to evolve in such a way that people are going to try to capture them, especially if they want money and power. Then how do we create enough systems? How do we create enough different experiments running in parallel such that we have a shot, right? There's a shot that that the five out of 50 that are, that are actually long-term incentivized in the right way and, and created in the right way have a shot at surviving it. And you might look at something like Bitcoin and say, it go, go back to like Namecoin, Mastercoin, the first round of ICOs, it sort of has proven durability over a 10-year time horizon. It still has a long way to go, obviously. But over time, that, that, that's actually led, I think, in, in, to, to essentially layers of true believers. And you can literally see that on chain, right? The, the holders that are just like, nope, this is actually what I want and I'm not going to sell now. And you see, you see that sort of happening on chain. So that's the best I've got. I'm, I mean, I'm curious if others have better thoughts, but I have sort of resigned myself to, yep, human systems are going to be subject to take over by humans. And so create create as many systems as possible running in parallel as possible. And then hopefully the best ones survive for the longest and then over time aggregate all the market share. Yeah, Mark, uh, Christine and I actually wrote a little bit about this evolution of decentralization and centralization and like the kind of like capture of these more like centralized chains in the government oh, process. So Mark, I would love to hear you on this. So lately I've been putting some of these issues in terms of the dangers of ignorance versus the dangers of malice. Hmm. And, and in particular, so Agoric has built a governance framework uh, for contracts. For we, we, we have blockchain, we have contracts. But in order to do on-chain governance decisions about whether or not to upgrade a contract. We have a whole governance framework. I see Chris Hibbert is here. He's the one who built our governance framework. Yeah. And, but the, the way I see the issues around what problem we're solving is that early on in a contract, and we can say the same thing for blockchain as a whole, but let's just focus on individual contract. Early on in a contract, your major danger is ignorance, specifically mm -hmm. that the contract might not mean what you think it means. 
it might have a bug in it. It might be, it might actually be written maliciously. The bug, if it has one, might be exploitable, or simply that the emergent effects of the contract under adversarial play are very different than what was intended. There's all sorts of ways in which you can just have the danger of not really understanding the contract that you thought you understood. Yeah. Over time, the dangers of ignorance go down as the contract is out there, as there's more eyeballs on it, as people try to, to, to find and exploit bugs, especially as people play test it adversarial, adversarially with real assets at stake, you come to have more and more confidence over time that you understand the contract. And also the stability of the contract comes to be more and more valuable because now you have more coordination around the shared understanding of what the contract is. Now, the other danger is the da exactly the danger that you were just talking about, which is the dangers of malice of, and governance, even good governance systems still can provide an opportunity to change things in bad faith, to change things in a way that serves some interests at cost to other interests and possibly in violation of the original intention. Yeah. So one thing that, uh, that we've been talking about at Agoric, we have not implemented it, but I think it's a good, good example of the kind of arrangement that can balance these two issues and the way in which they change over time is to have the contract, when it gets launched, have as part of its governance arrangement an announced schedule for escalating the supermajority needed to make a decision. So maybe at first it gets, it gets launched with the governance arrangement where two-thirds supermajority is needed to make an upgrade decision. But over time, on, an, on a schedule that had already been announced, that escalates towards unanimity and then even beyond unanimity, at some point, you could have made an earlier commitment that at some later point, the contract becomes immutable. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a good model in general yeah. for how to deal with the issues of governance. Is governance really is needed when ignorance is high and yeah. you might need to correct mistakes, but it really is too costly to have governance which can make decisions when the danger of malice is high, which grows yeah. over time. Yeah, it's great. I love that framework. Mikey, you had some thoughts? Yeah, it's just a quick comment. I've, I've lately been trying to advocate with a number of different blockchains, basically the same concept of have your launch and then have a very well-defined schedule for when you're going to stop making changes. You're going to need changes yeah. right after you launch. You're going to find bugs. People are going yeah. to break things. You're going to realize stuff that you thought was going to work, didn't work, et cetera. That's fine. Set aside one, two, five years, whatever you need, but they should be very clear and baked into the culture. And I think this is why yeah. Bitcoin held on so long to its 21 million. Yeah. It was baked deeply into the culture that we will not yeah. change this. And I think what Mark is saying is you need to bake into the culture really deeply that after five years, this system is not changing. If you want something new, you go build something new. You, this, we do not update mm. this one anymore. I've struggled though to get people to buy into this. I don't know if anyone has ideas on how you can convince people to follow this model. We have a comment also from Joel Dietz, and then I do want to get to the last question on AI. So let's keep the, that evolution maybe a, a minute or so. Joel. Yeah, Mark, your comment made me think of this unpublished essay by Nick Zabo, where he was sort of talking about the history of law in the Middle Ages and multiple tiered systems. So there was this pretty long standing system where there was ecclesiastical law in addition to common law. And basically, if there was a breach in like standard, for example, inheritance practice, mm -hmm. then the ecclesiastical law could like overreach and basically inject into a particular case. And of course, being Nick Zabo, he ties this to the history of smart contracts and stuff. But that just is interesting because you can also have potentially multiple sort of tiered systems of, of legal inspectors. Yeah. Just as a thought. Yeah. And we see some of this in the Constitution. I mean, the Constitution having predated public choice theory or any actual analytical tools for, for, for modeling the problems they were trying to solve. It's a brilliant piece of work. So one of the things that, that's in the Constitution that's very much along these lines is that there's different degrees of friction for making different kinds yeah. of decisions 
And there's different time constants over which you have to maintain agreement in order for the decision to happen. And the so it's very, very hard to make an amendment, but it's not impossible. We've got amendments over time, but they but but it's but we've only have a moderate number. And the to bring together a constitutional convention, which would potentially change everything, to bring that together is so hard that it's never happened. And the 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 the, ele- the period between electing the senators is different than congressmen is is, di- is different obviously than Supreme Court justices. So having these different time constants and different degrees of friction that are weighted against the degree of danger and of making a bad decision and the difficulty of recovering from bad decision, I think I think our governance systems all can be can still be are not thought out as well as what James Madison did before he had the analytical tools available to us. We could be doing a lot better with regard to segmenting different decisions into these different categories. Dean, do you have a final comment on this too? I saw your hand up. Not sure if it's relevant. Yes. I, I was going to say, I, I note the interesting thing that I've been thinking about with respect to those that how hard it is to change a me- the, the constitution at this point is it may have hardened just a little too fast because what ends up happening is we get essentially corruption of it by this the, the cr- taking tiny little holes and turning them into large holes you can drive a truck through such that we're now we now have a lot of stuff that's acting effectively outside of what the constitution had intended to employ and so it is an interesting balance as i said in in software systems what you would like is is at some point, it goes from the system evolves in place to it evolves to a point where you can exit and 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 users can optionally exit. We 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 given how much people are going wow and the regu- given the regulatory framework of the U.S. I'm going to leave and go elsewhere. We're we're at that point. The problem is there aren't that many yeah. places to exit to. So yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. it's there is a trade off where if you freeze things too early, then people just yeah. find a way to break it, right? Correct. Rather than work within the system to evolve it, albeit slowly. Mm. Yeah. Okay, final question, because we're now coming up on the hour. To you, Avichal, maybe leave it, close it out on a note of a positive vision for the future of like private transactions mm. and shielded transactions, especially in light of AI. They are going to be a positive factor, negative factor to this. How can you paint a world that includes those, those two bits? Yeah, AI is a whole can of worms. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I tend to think it's generally good to be an optimist. I think there's this natural human tendency to see new things and be scared of them. And, and but that's been true at basically every moment of human history. It's just like you see the new thing, like every, literally everything from fire to cannons to the first PCs to it's just that's just human nature. You see it and you're like, whoa, this could go terribly poorly if we did this the wrong way. Uh, and yet here we are. We haven't killed ourselves yet. And so history would suggest that we'll figure out a way to, to sort of contain it and, and we'll figure it out. And so I tend to be optimistic. I also tend to think that if you if you sort of think about most humans are good, which I tend to believe, like I think most most people are good people, then then the the most of the users of the technology will will tend to be good people. And so really what what we need to do is not be afraid of the technology, but it, it's it, it's actually feels scary, but what we need to do is get the technology in the hands of as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Which actually feels really scary, but is actually, I think, the only way to make sure that the the good actors have the same tools as the not good actors, and then in in aggregate, all of the good actors outnumber all of the bad actors. So, like in the in the in the private context, I think the way this plays out is like if the if the UX friction, let's say, to using privacy technologies is too high, like I have to go to some maybe not even GitHub, I have to go to some site, I have to download the code, I have to compile the code, then I got to run my own node, I got to set up my own VPN, like you start enumerating all the things you got to do. And it's a command line interface to generate the trend. No normal human is going to do that. But some some like weapons smuggler that's trying to get uranium to a terrorist is totally down to do that, right? That's it's like worth the friction for them to do that. And so really, the solution is like, drop the friction, make the UX really, really good and get it in the hands of all of the people because most people are actually fundamentally good. That's scary, I think, from a government perspective, but I think that's actually pragmatically the only answer is we just got to get this stuff in the hands of as many people as quickly as possible. 
Wonderful. Okay, let's close it here. Thank you so, so much Good for joining. It was a really, really, really big delight. Thanks everyone for your great question. This was really great. Thanks a lot. Um, it was fun. Uh, we, Thank you, everybody. We loved the way that you went. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And bye-bye. <laughs> Take care.